recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Kant, uh, Kant Critique of Judgment, Purposeness, the Beautiful and the Sublime, with your instructor, Francisca Aigner. For this seminar, we will read Kant's Critique of Power of Judgment, also known as the Third Critique. Despite Kant's eager claim to have enumerated in the critique of pure reason all the universal and necessary principles of the objectivity of objects, the later critique of our judgment deals with the several unruly things. This is necessary since there are, Kant's claim, several things that, that resist the supposedly universal and necessary conditions of objects of experience put forward in the critique of pure reason. Upon encountering one of these unruly things, we are puzzled. But how is it possible to encounter such unruly things in the experience and thus as part of nature, while it is at the same time impossible to a priori account for their possibility? In the seminar, we will look at Kant's claim that there is a specific sense in which one can make sense of such unruly things. It not be possible to cognize these unruly things, especially as living and beautiful things. Still, by introducing a different principle determining and reflecting judgment, a difference that had not yet been in place in the critique of pure reason, Kant argued that it is nevertheless possible to reflect to reflectively judge Burton Line, claim then according to an altogether different principle. As we will see, this principle is called purposiveness. The Vecken Mekite. This two-part seminar will introduce the critique of our judgment within the context of Kant's overall projects before focusing on the critique of the aesthetic power of judgment, the book's first part. We will look at the function and structure of aesthetic judgment and purposiveness before spending one seminar each on the meaning and function of the seminar and the sublime Kant's critical philosophy. This seminar will be followed by a second part focus on the critique of theological power of judgment. Francisca Agner works at the intersection of philosophy, performance, and music. In 2020, she completed her PhD at the Center for Research in Modern Art Philosophy in London, or European Philosophy in London, sorry, on this topic, Kant and on the topic Kant and Techniques. Completing her philosophical work, she has studied at PARTS, the School of Choreography and Dance in Bruxelles, directed by Anne Theresa de Kersmacher, and worked with Anna Infort on the performances Zeal, Rage, Angust, and Faust, awarded the Golden Lion at the Venice Biennale in 2017, as well as for William Forsyth, Mette Inkswarten, Alejandra Bassetis, and others. Her own works have been shown at the Kursten Festival, Festival des Arts in Bruxelles, Die Liste in Basel, Theatre de la Bastille in Paris, The Place in London, Prout in Vienna, Hall in Berlin, and etc. In 2019, the music for Faust by Anna Info, Inhoff, Billy Butthel, and Francis Geiner, and Elisa Douglas has, was released on the Berlin label PAN. Furthermore, Francisca Einer is part of the Holy Herden Vocal Ensemble, with whom she tours internationally. She performs her own solo project, Cello and Vocal, under the name Franken. Her first solo EP will be released within the Icelandic label Bedroom Community in the fall of 2021. In 2021, Francisca also collaborated with Daniel Genasis, on the sound art piece, The Close Word, which won the John Fry's Award. Francisca, the floor is all yours. All right. Well, hello. Um, thank you for this introduction. And thank you for joining here today. I'm uh, very honored to be able to talk about this book. Um, kind of start critique, the critique of the power of judgment, which was published in 1790. And as the title, or as I already, well, the title doesn't have the third in it, but as I already said, it's known as the third critique, which means that it follows the first critique, which is called the critique of pure reason with its famous two editions. 
1781 and 1787, and then it also follows from the second critique, um, the Critique of Practical Reason, which was published in 1788, and then two years later, in 1790, we arrive at the third critique, the Critique of the Power of Judgment. Um, yeah, like Vito already introduced, we're going to be, be dealing with the first part of the third critique. So the critique of the aesthetic power of judgment. And then um, next year, such as the plan, um, there will be another seminar on teleological judgment. So the second part of the third critique, because I thought it would not be possible to um, make our way through everything in four seminars. Um, we will read the English translation, or at least I've sent around the Cambridge University Press English translation of the third critique by Paul Geyer and Eric Matthews. And so I will refer to those page numbers. And um, obviously I, I, I read it in English, but I, yeah, we will refer to this common um, English translation together in order to be able to understand each other. Um, there are a number of practical issues um, to be addressed before we begin. Um, and the first one is that maybe um, each of you could introduce yourselves quickly and say a little bit about, um, yeah, like where you come from and what, if there are any specific interests that you have in Kant um, or in this book, or if you have read Kant before, like your level of familiarity and stuff. So, because it's actually not such a big uh, class. So I feel like we we could um, have very good conversations and maybe for that, that's good to quickly introduce each other. So we could just, should I just start then? Yeah. All right. I'm Andreas. Uh, I'm from Denmark, Copenhagen. Uh, I'm an MA student in theology and have already done my thesis. Uh, so I had a couple of points to spare and got a lot of freedom in uh, my way of spending these kind of ECTS points. So this is kind of a, a, pro a program of, of uh, attending at another university. Um, since my undergraduate time, I've worked on a specific uh, theme, maybe or investigation or arrangement. What I've been interested in has been, or, or am interested in, is uh, a kind of uh, dynamic nothingness, uh, or just a nothing or no thing. Uh, I, for this, I've read Primarily, it's been Nancy and, and Blanchot, but uh, also a lot of theologians, German uh, primarily. Uh, and now for, the, for this year, I'm going to work with a theologian and a psychiatrist on a project concerning the psychiatry in Denmark, Copenhagen, and in the spectrum of schizophrenia and how the consciousness of hyperreflectivity works. Uh, with this kind of focal point of nothing. I have read a bit of Kant, never the big critiques, just the smaller books. Um, and this one seemed like a good seminar, also a good place maybe to get in be because of this reflexive judgment and also this way of thinking of uh, relations instead of substance in Kant. Um, but I, I am very green to this book. And so it's it's all new to me, but I hope that I can get around that kind of stuff. Yes, that's that's it uh, for me. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you know, this book, um, I don't know really the, the details of your study, but this book is very interesting because it tries to make sense of something um, which isn't a something in the categorical sense. So, in, you know, for Kant, in order for something to become a something to then deal with, according to the forms, uh, there are very specific um, conditions to that and anything that cannot appear in these forms actually is one you know are different forms of nothingness and so for example in the critique of pure reason there's a very interesting uh, moment in between the um, 
uh, transcendental analytic and transcendental dialectic, which is a table of nothingness. I don't know if you've ever looked no. at that. And um, so, yeah, there's definitely some philosophical resources in Kant if you're interested in um, something and how a messy, amorphous matter becomes a something or different categorizations of nothingness. Yeah. And we will deal a little bit with that, but not not directly, but yeah, I hope it will be interesting for you. And uh, are you a certificate student, Andreas? No, yeah. I just, ah, no. I'm, I'm inscribed at the uh, University of Copenhagen. So I'm just like switching a, a course at my own school. With, but uh, you with need to three of, write- Three of yours. You need to write like a paper and get credits for this course. Yes, or yeah, do some kind of exam. It said yeah. the, like right. something that you yeah, so people can see that I've attended. Yeah. Uh, at least it's oh. not so strict, but they need some kind of document. Yeah. All right. Next one. Hey, I don't know since I don't have video with me. I think <laughs> maybe a rhythm. Um, um, I'm Arman. I'm a novelist from Iran, based in Iran, living, living in Iran. I'm here uh, mostly for actually a um, continuation of the other uh, seminar on Kant that you had. I think there's the similar themes here, um, especially going from understanding to reason and um, using judgment to the uh, other seminar. And um, my um, familiarity with Kant is very basic. Uh, actually, I haven't read the, the third critique. Uh, I have read the, um, um, minimally the two first critique, but not the third critique. That would be very interesting for me to read with you and the class. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so nice to have you back, Armin. Yeah, I taught a seminar on, on Kant's very last unpublished manuscript, um, the Opus Postumum, um, which I think is where Armin and me first met. Um, and there are definitely some themes of the third critique um, that reappear in the Opus Postumum. And it's a very interesting book because some of these more like, like dynamic um, investigations uh, of you know our faculties and our relationship to the world sort of like find themselves then further developed um, in these very late writings. And also, um, obviously, there's a, a big parallelism because of um, um, the necessity posited by Kant to provide a bridge. A transition which in a way one could also say is already um, his attempt in the third critique to make a bridge between the first two critiques or between nature and freedom all right next one uh, so Maybe I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm Gabriel. I'm from um, Georgia, the country, not the state. And uh, uh, so I, I, I finished conservatory, then I did my master in philosophy. Uh, 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 so I did my master about um, Quentin Mayasus and Graham Harmon's ways to overcome the correlation. So I, I'm into mm -hmm so-called speculative realism but uh, although it's not so clear if there is some kind of unified group of mm. yeah so it's complicated but so why can't because so i have spent one year reading uh, kant when i was uh, first when it was my first year in masters uh but it was uh, the critic of pure reason uh but you know the time spent with kant is never enough and also, the third critique is very, very important for me to have this whole picture of Kant and um, yeah, what to say? Uh, 
Well, it's yeah. going to be great to have you here because I guess because of your fam familiarity with different critiques of correlationism, I I have I hope that you will be able to you know be like uh, a critical voice. Yeah, and, uh, because it's 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 very important. The, the whole point is that uh, to go beyond the transcendental philosophy, you have to you have job with Kant. So uh, exactly. that's uh, the main guy here in history. And so yeah, I, I would like to spend as much time with Kant as possible. For me, yeah. And I'm very excited to, uh, for, to be here. I, you know, you know I, I, I had offer from Kingston University. I, I, I was yeah. trying to take the course with uh, Howard Cagle, uh, uh, but unfortunately, I could not go because, uh, because of some problems. Uh, maybe I deferred, and maybe next year I will go. But hopefully, I found this course which offers also the uh, readings of. Uh, yeah. Um, so well. My Howard was my MA and PhD supervisor, so I think very highly of him, and he's a very good friend of mine. I, so, I, I, sorry, I interrupted. I, I saw your uh, abstract, which was was very interesting for me because uh, the question of techniques and Kant. So, question of techniques became very interesting for me after recently I read Yu Kui's "The Question Concerning Technology in China." In China, uh, and yeah. then I became familiar with this. Simon Don, Stigler, which were, I did not know anything about those thinkers. And so your abstract was very intriguing for me. And yeah, I, I, I would. Yeah, want, I said I would, my it. work is uh, exactly at this intersection. Oh, so I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. We will be talking a little bit about techniques of nature, this concept that he introduced us in the third critique, but it will not be my focus because I, you know, it's like a, it's a very inventive um, kind of dynamic book the third critique and it's um i think also especially for if you're not that familiar with you know the first critique or kantianism it doesn't matter because i think in a way it's even better because to kind of read kant from the perspective of the third critique is very different than to first sort of like have this anatomical analytical um introduction in the third critique it's like he has taken everything apart and then he realizes that it doesn't quite work in that matter. And so he introduces like a dynamic into that system. And so you guys will, um, I mean, I'm not saying it's not good to have read the other critiques or not be familiar, but it's not a problem in the sense that I think it's a very interesting thing to kind of like read Kant from the other side. Um, because this is him, struggling and trying to find solution inventing things in order to overcome problems that he sees in his own system which is something he will continue doing until the end of his life and the opus postumum which i talked about last year in a way is the culmination of that you know it's like a very different kant it's like more critical of transcendental philosophy than um any german idealist that came after him it's um yeah so um all right Next one. Okay, I can go. Hey. Uh, hi, I'm Lucia. Uh, I have um, a background in art history and comparative literature. I work as a critic, even though I don't like that term very much. Um, and um, I, I work with uh, books and uh, in the publishing industry as well. So uh, I'm really interested in, in how this whole seminar is going to work. <laughs> and uh, I, I have just basic familiarity with Kant. Um, we, we did some of his texts in aesthetics classes and that's about it. Yeah. Um, are you gonna, um, mm -hmm. do you need a credit? Yes, yes, or? I'm taking this for her. Great. Right. Yeah. I'm looking forward. And maybe I'll go next. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Martin. And I'm also coming from Copenhagen or ca calling in from Copenhagen. I'm from Denmark. Mm -hmm. And I uh, have a background in mathematics. I have a PhD in mathematics and have researched in that for a while, but uh, recently sort of uh, quit. Uh, the academic route and um, uh, my interest here doesn't really have anything to do with with that i'm broadly interested in german idealism um, and sort of trying to 
build uh, on the small smatterings of, of philosophy that I've, uh, uh, philosophy courses that I've taken uh, through the years. Um, I have a little bit of familiarity with some, yeah, broad familiarity with Kant, uh, the prolegomena, and a little bit of the critique of pure reason. Um, Great. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to be here. I'm really looking forward to it. And do you have to write something? And, and... Um, I'd, I'd like to, yeah. All right. Yeah. Cool. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, I'm Kamal, and I'm also a certificate student at the New Center. Uh, my background is in physics. Uh, I did my PhD in physics and uh, did research in physics, but now I'm also uh, in the non-academic route right now. Um, I'm interested in philosophy, especially in Kant's uh, philosophy. I read the first two critics, and I'm really kind of obsessed with Kant's uh, regulative ideas. And I heard that the third critic is really, very really crucial also for the regulative ideas. So I'm, I'm really excited to join this course and, you know, learn with you. Um, that's great. So you can be our um, first critique comparison person because it's, it's going to be very interesting for you if you're familiar with um, the transcendental dialectic and some of the architectonic etc because a lot of the work that um, was done by reason in the first critique will here become the work of the power of judgment and it kind of goes a little bit silently you know like he doesn't announce that um, certain responsibilities are shifted around but they clearly are and it's very interesting and very confusing to try and sort of like really map um, also the reasons why um, you know these were insufficient solutions in the first critique and yeah so it's uh, it's good to have you here if that is your interest and you know a lot about it, that's great and you can always um, inform us and yeah all right. Um, I'm Guido. Um, I'm here in Chicago in the US. Uh, I studied art history and fine arts at um, the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, I encountered Kant a few times before uh, the third critique, uh, just in art history classes and classes on mm. aesthetics, although um, I never really had the chance to study him in depth. So that's pretty much why I'm here. I decided to uh, give uh, the critique of judgment um, just a, a good study for once. Um, I'm a non-certificate student. I'm just taking this class out of uh, just out of interest. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's good to have you here uh, if you come more from an aesthetics background, because um, as I will also speak about a little bit about in the lecture that I've prepared is that um, I don't necessarily read this as a book um, on art, I would say. Hmm. But it's uh, also true that it's not not a book on art. Um, but there are very different, you know, approaches to it. And if you um, are familiar with the aesthetic tradition um, and um, maybe have in the past read it, um, as a book that was primarily about art and you can maybe supplement some of my my stuff uh, that I'm gonna bring. So it's very good to have you here. Um, all right, I think that's it now. Mm. So I, I just, I'm gonna say a couple of uh, more um, practical things, very short. Um, so the first is that if you look at the seminar plan that I've sent around, um, in the very last seminar, I said that my friend and colleague Cooper is going to join us for a dis the discussions on census communis. Um, but unfortunately, he cannot join us in this last seminar, but and he could join us in the third. And so I would like to ask if it's okay with you that we switch around the third and the fourth seminar because he works on his PhD is on the German concept of Gemeinwesen and he works a lot on census communis and the more kind of like political dimensions um, in relationship to the French Revolution, etc. And so I think it will be very interesting to have him 
and have this conversation. So I would like to switch these two seminars around. So basically read the materials that were supposed to be in the fourth seminar in the third, and then in the very last seminar, read the materials that I've put in the third seminar. And I'm going to send around an updated seminar plan. And I'm very sorry for that, but I think it will be um, yeah, a real pleasure to have them with us. Um, so that's one of the things. Um, then um, if you want to have credit, there are certain things you have to do. And um, so one is that you have to write an essay in the end of the seminar. Um, but I mean, I hope you will also want to write an essay because I guess there will be a lot to talk about. And what I normally do is that um, I offer like a one-on-one -on -one tutorial the Monday after the last seminar um, in case you want to discuss your essay question, um, you know, and kind of like have any questions. You don't have to attend that, but um, you can if you want. And it's like a short one-on-one -on -one session in which we can speak things through. And I'll ask Vitor to um send around like a sheet for that and then the other thing that you have to do is to do a presentation and i'm i don't think it will be such a big problem here because we are not that many people as in the past but in the past it has some sometimes become a bit of a problem because if like you know 20 people need to make a presentation it takes up a lot of time and so i've kind of like thought about how to um um make these presentations um less than just something you have to do and i was thinking basically that maybe especially since we are so few um each of you could really choose like uh one line in the materials from the class that we're going to discuss in that class like one sentence maximum two sentences but i think the best would be to have one sentence and then either um, give a maximum five idea, five minute long, so something like 400, 500 words in written form if you were to write it out, either sort of like exegesis of the sentence or a critical response to that sentence. So for instance, you know, thinking about Deleuze or thinking about Rancière or Derrida or Lyotard, like all these people who have written very um, intimately and very wonderfully about the third critique. They have all responded to particular parts of the third critique. So you can try and isolate, for instance, like one sentence in Kant and then give a 500 word sort of like presentation of someone else's response or critique to that. Or Fred Moten or, you know, like you name it, there are many different sort of like authors to choose from um, because it's a very, um, or Hegel or Heidegger, or I don't know really, you know, what your interests are, but there's many Freud, there's many different um, people, all of whom have very intimately worked on questions of artistic form or pleasure or um, satisfaction or, you know, so I think anything from artistry to psychoanalytic literature, there's a vast variety of um, things to choose from. So, yeah, so I would like to really make the presentations part of you know, that you really offer something to the group discussion, something that you think is important and that we should discuss together rather than just making it a chore that you have to give like, you know, a presentation or something like that. Um, so these are sort of like the practical things that I want to say. All right, let's get to it. So I've prepared five points uh, for today's seminar. Um, I will start with um, an introduction um, of the overall project of the Critique of the Power of Judgment, so the Kritik der Urteilskraft in German. Um, my second point will then look at the, in more detail at the question of the relationship between purposiveness, so this is Zweckmäßigkeit in German, and pleasure, Lust or wohlgefallen satisfaction. So the question, why is purposiveness pleasurable? Which is in a way the question addressed in the analytic of the beautiful, so the first book of um, the critique of the power of judgment. And of the analytic of the beautiful, I have assigned the first couple of paragraphs 
to be read for today. So why is purposiveness pleasurable? My third point will then focus on the structure of the analytic of the beautiful so that we will have an overview of mm, his argument and how it's organized and the kind of like methodological tools he uses in order to lay open the analytic of the beautiful. And then for my fifth and final point, hopefully we will have some time for that. I will introduce Jacques Derrida's reading his sort of like interpretation of the notion of pleasure as it was introduced or invented, we could say, by Kant in the third critique. So hopefully we'll get to the end. So there are these five points, just so that you know what is to come. Um, so as I already said before, um, in response to Vido, um, um, my introduction of the overall topic of the third critique will begin with two very common ideas that are often made or modes of reading that are often made in relation to the third critique. So firstly, there's the idea that we can easily separate the first and the second part of the third critique. And the first part, of course, concerns natural and artistic beauty, so on aesthetic judgment. And um, the second part concerns living things and, in a sense, contains Kant, Kant's philosophy of biology as he deals with the teleological power of judgment, which for anyone interested in Kant's notion of techniques, he also, in the longer first introduction, initially calls technical power of judgment. Um, so, and the link between these two parts, so aesthetic judgment and teleological judgment between natural and artistic beauty and the living thing is often under theorized or in fact considered non-important because it is maybe a little bit difficult to understand on a first reading or something like that. I'm not sure. I don't want to accuse uh, anyone, anything, but it's often, the link isn't, um, isn't very deeply considered. And so from that follows a second idea that the first part of natural and artistic beauty constitutes its own critique. And that in fact, we can read only that. And so separate Kant's reflection on beauty be it natural or artistic beauty, from his reflections on life and the living thing. And this is in fact what one often in my experience finds in you know, certain aesthetics courses that we only read the first part of the book. And the second part, we, which I don't know, we don't know about it. Um, and in a way one can say I'm doing the same because we're only reading the first book, but uh, it's a matter of time here. And, um, and I hope, you know, that some of you might return for uh, reading for the second book, second part together. And I'm not saying that, you know, these kind of two ways of reading the book are um, not substantiated by Kant. And in fact, there are some things that he says that might lead one to believe that this is really not a unified book. So in the longer and unpublished first introduction, I don't know if you had a look at that, um, he writes that the second part of the third critique, so the part on, tele on the teleological power of judgment, and a quote from him, he says, could have always been appended to the theoretical part of philosophy. So, all right, so he writes the third critique and then he says it has these two parts and the second part, it could always have been appended to the theoretical part of philosophy, which of course means the critique of pure reason, all of a sudden meaning that we don't actually know <laughs> where it would go there. He doesn't specify where it should go. Um, and why he writes it so much behind, or then why he includes it in the third critique. You know, he would have also, he would have written a third edition of the critique of pure reason, but he did not. So it might seem that the second book 
in a way does not properly belong to the critique of the power of judgment. Um, because it could or perhaps should have been added to the critique of pure reason, even though we do not know exactly where it should have gone. And so we find ourselves you know, when we look at the just the form of the third critique, already like knee deep in these kind of systematic questions of transcendental philosophy, of like where the different parts go, what is the relation between the first and the second critique. We have a non-unified book in which the first book on aesthetic judgment is seemingly a third critique proper, and then the second part seemingly should have in fact been somewhere else. It's very confusing. So there's a problematic link for many reasons between the first part and the second part in the third critique. So when we start doing the third critique, we need to keep in mind that we need to look for this link between natural and artistic beauty and the living thing, between aesthetic judgment and teleological judgment. It is not that obvious we could say and in fact the third critique itself is intended by Kant to be as a whole even though it is non-unified itself and itself in need of a link the third critique as a whole is also supposed to be a link a bridge a mediation because it's the third, it comes third, so he has already written two critical works at this point. Um, it comes third, and it follows from, there is obviously a need to write it, because according to transcendental philosophy, and I, I'm sure all of you have heard this in some way or another, um, there are two irreconcilable worlds, we could say. On the one hand, there is um, nature, uh, which is subject to cognition and which is the object of theoretical philosophy, um, which was addressed in the first critique. And on the other side, there is practical philosophy, which concerns its itself with questions of these practical questions of freedom and morality. Um, and between these two worlds, we could say, there's an incalculable gulf. There's a, a rift between them. Um, in order to unravel this gulf or understand this gulf and understand why the third critique and specific teleo teleology or teleological judgment, um, as well as the third critique as a whole, um, are intended by Kant as the much needed bridge transition um, over this gulf, we have to uh, dive a little bit into the critical project as a whole and understand sort of like um, Kant's philosophical invention with transcendental philosophy. And obviously I, I can't, um, go into very much detail but I'm going to try and, and schematize it a little bit so sort of like the context that Kant inherited the context from the philosophical context from which he worked which um, demanded that he um, put forth his own system of transcendental philosophy including his invention of what is called transcendental idealism um, and there's of course a need for it he did not um he wouldn't have written it if he did not feel there was a a problem that he needed to overcome with this in a certain sense so but then his solution to the problem created more problems which is this sort of like two world problematic and so then he builds the um third critique as a bridge and then the problem that i've now tried to show is that it it's itself is the bridge but the bridge itself is in need of a link and this is in, in a way the big sort of like systematic problem uh, that we very briefly are thrown into when we start reading the third critique so Kant inherited a philosophical schism we could say that is 
two mutually exclusive answers to the question of the relation between reality and my representations of that reality, which is, of course, the skeptical epistemological question per se. And um, these two mutually exclusive answers um, are rationalism on one side and skepticism, uh, sorry, and empiricism on the other. Um, so on the one side, we have rationalists like Descartes, Leibniz, um, etc., that uh, argued, very schematically put, um, that you know knowledge is primarily derived from some form of innate ideas and an exercise of pure reason, pure. So they believe that there are certain truths and principles that are independent of sensory experience. Um, and that reason alone can uncover universal and necessary truths about the world. And on the other hand, side very schematically put again, we have empiricism with you know people like Locke, Berkeley, and Hume, um, all of whom held a view that knowledge is primarily based on sensory experience and observation. Of course, each of them, you know, slightly different. So this is really, really very schematic. And they argued that there is some, you know, we begin as some sort of like tabula rasa or something like that. And all knowledge and understanding of the world is acquired like through experience and through the senses. And Kant found himself in like a really very, um, uh um polemic polemical time in which there seemed to be no reconciliation possible between these two um philosophical answers in a way and um his invention his philosophical invention um is in a way a mediation or an attempt of a mediation between these two positions so this is how he is often read, you know, as a kind of mediating figure. Um, and he did this, he put forth this mediation by way of what is called transcendental idealism, um, which I can briefly um, introduce, but you can also, you know, read up on that yourself just to get a little bit more familiar with it if you're not already. Um, uh, I will quickly introduce what is normally called his Copernican turn, which um, one finds in the Critique of Pure Reason. So um, rather than thinking that, you know, it is through pure reason alone that we have access to um, necessary unchanging truths or that it is only through experience, um, that we will be able to have access to reality. Kant's proposition was that there are certain forms, uh, which are transcendental forms, and um, the objects that we encounter um, must conform to these forms, must conform to our knowledge of them. So this means that the subject of cognition, so the one who judges, the one who encounters these things, contributes a number of a priori forms. Um, and these are either of sensibility or of the understanding. So there are two kinds of forms. <laughs> Again, we have another duality, which he will then go through great lengths in order to try and <laughs> bring them together. This is sort of like, you know, Hegel's um, big uh, mm, joke, or I don't really know how to call it, like about Kant that, you know, he like cut things in half, cut things apart, only to then spend the rest of his life trying to put them back together. So um, we have these different kinds of forms, sensibility um, and the understanding. And they are a priori, so he has this distinction between a priori and a posteriori, which means, so they are a priori, which means that they do not have their origin in experience. So it's not that 
we gain them through living and through experiencing things. But it's rather exactly the other way around that if anything is to be an object for me, so an object that I can cognize, that I can make sense of, it must conform to these forms, meaning that it is these forms which make experience and these objects of experience possible. So um, I think we have very different knowledges of philosophies. I'm just trying to, um, you know, I'm sorry if this is uh, very repetitive for you, but this is in a way very important also to understand sort of like the intervention that the third critique does. So there are these two kinds of forms. As I said, we have the forms that, um, um, forms of sensibility, which um, are called the forms of intuition, and they are time and space on the one hand. And then we have the pure concepts of the understanding, which are also referred to as the categories, which are 12 in numbers. And they are forms of unity. They, so they, they are functions of the understanding and they are sort of like, we can, we can imagine them as sort of like, yeah, they, they, they give unity to matter which always must come from the outside for Kant. And we bring these forms with us upon encountering the world. So it's not that we would have access to these forms through, you know, in a vacuum or something. Like we need an encounter. We need sort of like uh, objects to be given to us. That, that is sort of like, um, in, a, in a way, like the end of all cognition. We need things to be given to us. And then we bring these forms through which these forms can then, uh, through which these things can then appear to us as objects. Um, and what these forms do, so they're forms of unity, I have said, what they do is that they allow us to judge. And in fact, they allow us to determinately judge what we encounter in the world. And that means that we subsume certain things. So determinately judging means we, there's a, um, an operation of subsumption going on. So what does this mean? Mm. Judging, urteilen, in the logical sense of the term, is the operation of subsuming, of throwing something under. That means of classifying a particular object, so an instance of something that we encounter, under a universal law. Because um, the concepts that we have in order to unify their universal and necessary, they a priori. So we refer a particular to a law, a universal or a general law that it depends on. So subsumption or judgment, determinate judgment means in Kant to put a particular, so an instant uh, under the legislation of a general law to say, this is a table, for instance. We put a table we encounter in the world under the category of table as a whole. Um, and this operation of subsumption, of throwing things under their general law is called determining judgment in Kant. Um, and in a sense, the determination of nature that is, nature here considered as the sum total of these kinds of objects, you know, which we we can classify under these general laws as particular instances of general laws. Um, um, so the determination of nature considered as the sum total of these kind of objects 
that is they're always objects of the natural sciences we could say that is the object the theoretical object of the first critique so the critique of pure reason and nature and this is important here refers to physics and newton it refers to the natural sciences that is it refers to the whole of the phenomenal world that is um, ruled as it were by a certain set of universal laws and thereby gives rise to experience which is always one in Kant as organized um, like a whole of experience and this act of subsumption um, of throwing something particular that we encounter under the universal law that it depends on is in a way you know what someone like Heidegger has has articulated in many different ways as something that I would call like a logic of obedience we um, we find this idea that through that according to the transcendental idealist view we have these forms and that the op all objects must conform to these forms um, and of course we can ask what is the condition of possibility that the world really conforms you know really appears to us in these objects and someone like Heidegger would say yes but it's the logic of obedience and then he will call it like in framing, like gestell in like, you know, question concerning technology, et cetera. There's, um, um, there's like a certain violence at play here. But even my reading of Freud, I think, is not that far from that, but very different and for different reasons. You know, um, Freud, who I believe is a very good reader of Kant and studied under Brentano, um, a prominent neo-Kantian of the time um, in a way also understands conceptual forms as a mode of defending oneself from uh, the overwhelming stimuli that the world provides to us um, and sort of like dictating onto the world in what way it may appear to us in a well-ordered manner that doesn't overwhelm us, that doesn't cause, you know, traumata that, well, that is in a way the problem that there are certain things for someone like Freud or, you know, we have to, we know that this categorical apparatus of ordering and, and telling the world how it, how it can hurt us in a way, you know, or how it can appear to us you may appear to me only in the form of that, only in the form of that as well-ordered objects that behave in the regulated and um, uh, ways that that doesn't always work uh, because there is such a thing as uh, traumata, certain things that overwhelm us and that in fact flood our psychic apparatus and destroy these forms. So, but this is a, another <laughs> topic, you know, but there is in a way this idea in transcendental idealism that um, I can only have uh, access to the world um, according to certain conditions. I can only have, there are very determinate boundaries to what I can know. Um, and um, that my access to that which is, um, is ordered and made possible according to a set of a priori forms, which are twofold uh, of sensibility and of the understanding. And yes, and we could say, broadly speaking, that um, 
it deals with um, problems of determination and subsumption, which means to throw things under, which always has like a certain kind of violent um, uh, aspect to them, theorized by many from Hegel to Heidegger, etc. Um, so Kant's mediation between these two philosophical schools that he found himself with, so rationalism and empiricism, by way of his transcendental idealist uh, solution of some kind of mediation between pure rational forms and a really strong sort of like empirical element at the same time, sits a little bit uncomfortable, but nevertheless in between rationalism and empiricism, and that he put forth an idea of cognition according to which we can only have knowledge proper. So knowledge in like the strong sense of the word um, of spatio-temporal objects um, that conform to these forms. Um, and so are legislated by the mechanical laws of nature. At the same time, however, Kant was very much aware that we can nonetheless, we might not be able to know, but we can nonetheless think of a whole other class of concepts. And these for him are the concepts of reason, which are um, usually called ideas for clarity in order to differentiate them from the categories. That is, we can think of a whole other world that is the noumenal world rather than the phenomenal world. And these ideas are famously threefold in Kant. And in fact, he inherited this. Um, they are the kind of different domains of the special metaphysics. Um, so the, they are God, the idea of God, the idea of world, and the idea of freedom. So we can think them, but we cannot cognize them because we can have no experience of these things. We can have, for Kant, no experience of God. We cannot prove, uh, you know, we cannot... We can never experience the whole world. We can think it. It's a, a necessary um, idea for us because we use it for systematization of our knowledge, but um, we cannot not cognize these ideas in the same way that we can cognize the ideas at uh, the uh, objects of the phenomenal world. Um, and what this means um, is that we can think of ourselves as free beings. And in fact, we must consider ourselves not only as a phenomenal being, as part of nature, but we must also think of ourselves and in fact act according to a universal maxim called the categorical imperative, which is the subject of the second critique. So everything I've said so far is the subject of the first critique. And the subject of the second critique is to think of ourselves and, and con, you know, um, understand the conditions of possibility of um, uh, free autonomous acts. Um, but we can have no determinate knowledge of such freedom. Because the determinate knowledge or cognition, as I said, is reduced to a spatio-temporal objects of experience. We can think of freedom and we have the duty to act uh, according to the categorical, categorical imperative. And so these ideas of pure reason have what Kant calls practical reality in the sense that we must bring them about through our act. But while we must act towards bringing them about, we have no knowledge, no determinate knowledge, no scientific knowledge of, for instance, the existence or inexistence of freedom resulting from these actions that we are nevertheless obliged to do. We can have no knowledge of ourselves as free beings. And this, of course, raises the question of whether rational 
autonomous free acts are possible in this world, <laughs> in nature. So how to reconcile nature as you know subject to the determinate laws of nature of physics etc and freedom on the other hand so the law of determinacy and then free will on the other and it seems that because of his transcendental solution to the problem between rationalism and empiricism he has himself had to you know <laughs> cut a number of stuff apart including he ended up with these with having to establish these determinate boundaries to what we can know and then has now this problem of how to reconcile nature and freedom how to reconcile the first critique and the second critique so there's a gulf an incalculable gulf another schism we could say in a way reproduced at the center of his own philosophy which exists between freedom on the, on the one hand and nature, determinism and free will. So between the sensible world of nature that is cognized and legislated by the understanding and then the super sensible thinkable world of freedom, which is the subject of reason and the will and the subject of the second critique. And there is no crossing possible. These two worlds are mutually exclusive. And yet, we must cross it. And the critique of the power of judgment, in a way, is Kant's attempt to cross it. So there are... I, I hope you are able to follow me in this very schematic sort of like outline of the problem, you know, that Kant finds himself in and his manifold philosophical inventions of trying to reconcile schisms only to reproduce these schisms on another level. And if you are, you know, if you read other books by Kant, you will, this is like a, one could say it's like a repetition compulsion or something like that. And he constantly finds himself in that same predicament. And he, he puts forth these incredible philosophical inventions and is so thorough and critical of himself that he will always realize sooner or later the insufficiency of the invention that he has done. So... According to the first and the second critique, there are these two realms worlds whatever we may call them um, two sets of laws governing these worlds on the one hand the natural law and on the other hand or natural scientific law and on the other hand the moral law sensible nature super sensible freedom or super our super sensible nature and they are mutually exclusive and they apply categorically which means these laws, which means that they are universal and necessary. So there's a claim to totality here. There is supposed to be nothing that escapes from the grasp of these two laws, let's say. Um, And we have seen that in judging determinately, which prior to the third critique, it wasn't called determinate judgment yet, it was just called judgment. And um, we subsume a particular, um, so an instant of something, um, a phenomenon in nature or a particular act when it comes to um, questions of practice, of, um, morality, under its universal law. So we give something a form, and this form always has to be necessary and universal um, for it to be transcendental. And, and these they are a priori in the sense that they make experience possible, but they do not come from experience. 
and yet Kant realized and it troubled him greatly for many years and there are many letters in which one can sort of um, follow uh, kind of grappling with this problem. The determining power of judgment of both nature and morality in some cases does not work. So there seems to be some things that simply do not obey to our forms, to our demand on them. They seem to have, as it were, their own form. They bring it with them. They organize themselves. They are not dependent on their unity, on their organization. On, they are not dependent on uh, our concepts or our faculties or our a priori forms. What then are these things uh, that have their own form? And of course, since we already know that we can only have knowledge proper um, of things that we can cognize, so things that we can subject to these um, objectively valid um, a priori forms, um, these forms, these disobedient forms are difficult to classify. And they are in fact, and the attempt to make sense of them is the third critique, let's say. And they are the aesthetic forms of natural and artistic beauty on the one hand, and then living things on the other hand. So they are the object of the first and the second part of the third critique. These things are objects, yes, but they are not phenomena the way that um, the objects of the natural sciences are part of the phenomenal realm and so are governed, are organized according to the universal laws of the understanding. They are not subject to the categorical order prescribed by the understanding. And so the question is, what can form even mean here? What is this form that we are talking about? What is special about it? What does Kant say about it? Um, <laughs> and, you know, in a way one can inquire into oneself and say, okay, well, natural beauties, artistic beauties, and the living thing. Mm, so, I don't know, beautiful flowers, <laughs> um, Michelangelo's statue, um, and a blade of grass or an animal, etc. All of whom, in a certain sense, are not necessary. They don't, they cannot be, their existence cannot be anticipated and is not considered necessary according to the mechanical laws of nature. That is the thing. Why does a flower need to have these kinds of forms? That's basically what Kant is saying. There seems to be, as far as I understand, no reason for it. It's, uh, I'm puzzled, you know. And they come in a myriad of different variations and um, and their relationship and dependence, dependence to the universal laws are, from the perspective of the understanding, contingent. They carry, a, uh, they carry contingency within them. And the thing is, if they had no law at all, however, we wouldn't call them beautiful. or we might not be able to judge them at all. They would be nothing for us. Um, and so Kant kind of tries to point out that upon, I mean, this is also very sort of like touching, as I, some, you know, sometimes he wasn't like a great 
um, friend of um, art galleries or he never went to these kind of social gatherings, etc. So this is a very different sort of like approach to the question of taste or beauty. He, he kind of seems to suggest that upon encountering one of these special kinds of objects, so natural beauty or a certain artistic form, I'm filled with a certain assurance that this form, while if I look at it from the perspective of the understanding and its a priori forms and universal laws is considered contingent, so not necessary, meaning it's an accident. I'm filled with the insurance that if I take another point of view, it nevertheless follows a law. What gives me this feeling? Where does this law come from? What is this law? So, and I'm, I'm, ref I'm reading here in a way, I'm giving you guys an, a sort of like a presentation of the introduction. Um, we haven't actually begun reading the um, analytic of the beautiful yet. So this is all sort of like um, a very schematic overview of Kant setting the scene himself, you know. So Kant says that, he suggests that these special kind of objects, as I said before, organize themselves. And what does that mean? It means that they organize themselves according to an end or a goal or a purpose, as if they had been intentionally made in this way. They are what he calls purposive. In German, it's Zweckmäßig. And this term is very central to the Sir Critique, and um, we will encounter it uh, over and over again over the next couple of weeks. And, um, and I hope that our understanding of it through these different sections that we will read will deepen. Um, for now, what, what we know is that there are these disobedient or unruly things that are in nature. So we can encounter them. We, we encounter them in the world, either in nature or we go to an art studio because he talks about both natural and artistic beauties. We can encounter them in the world. Um, and even the living being, obviously, we encounter it as part of nature and they bring with them their own form and they seem to follow their own end their own goal their own purpose they are different from all other objects that i can encounter in the sense that they do not we cannot subsume them under universal laws, they do not obey the law of the understanding and the forms that we are equipped with and that usually work so well for us. And um, they behave according to a purpose of their own. They're organized, they're self-organized, we could say. And from this follow two important consequences. Firstly, as I've already said, this purposive, diese Zweckmäßigkeit, this purposive form is considered contingent and accidental from the point of view of the understanding and reason, because this form cannot be classified according to the categories and concepts of nature and morality. We do not have concepts for them, determinate concepts. Consequently, while I may call these things beautiful, I cannot determinately judge them to be beautiful. Beauty is not a thing that I can have knowledge of, seemingly, for Kant, precisely because I cannot anticipate their form a priori the way that I can with the objects of nature. 
for instance. Uh, I'm going to mention this notion of anticipation. Um, little, like, you know, it's like an important thing to understand that how I try to briefly like point out with Freud or something like that. Like we have these for, for transcendental idealism, we have this conceptual apparatus, uh, which together with uh, these uh, a priori forms of intuition, time and space, they are, <laughs> we could say, yeah, they are the pure forms according to which everything else can come into view. So they are a priori. That means they come before. So because of them, I, I'm not really surprised by what I encounter in the world. I can anticipate. I, there is very high probability that it will in fact be a table. You know, like um, I, there, one of my, in fact, Howard Cagle, my, um, one of the professors at the Center for Research, the CMEP uh, that I studied at, he, he once said that he sometimes thinks of it that like Kant had this idea that in fact, it's not even like on the one hand, you could say the world always comes and sort of like troubles you and then you kind of capture it according to concepts and you tame them. And then, you know, you organize them and, and sort of like are able to deal with these sense stimuli but you could also through this notion of a priori and anticipation think of it the other way around that in fact the the subject of cognition like throws out anticipates things and just hopes that it will like hit something <laughs> fits or something like that so um and especially in the opus postumum this gets more and more um prominence this idea of anticipation which in certain senses, in terms of like he, he, describe, he describes scientific practice in that way. So the idea of like a silent observer who just sits there and waits for the world to reveal itself in its truth is not anymore the idea of scientific practice and possibly never was the idea of scientific practice that Kant had. He imagines like an idea of like a physicist uh, that is much closer to um the kind of like contemporary uh, phenomenon of quantum physics in which the presence of the scientist changes, you know, the experimental set setup in the, in the most obvious way, because he has this idea that we, we throw things out and make the world react <laughs> more or less like that, you know? So, okay, this is a small detour about the problem of anticipation, but it has this thing, like the forms they come in advance. They allow us to anticipate the world. They allow us to order what could be so overwhelming and um, painful in its messiness and in its chaos. They allow us to a priori order them um, and come to us in little bits and pieces that we can deal with, <laughs> we could say. Um, so when it comes to these special kinds of objects, the problem is precisely that they do not behave in that way. They always come as a surprise. I cannot anticipate them. I, which means that I cannot ponder their possibility without ever meeting one. Mm. I'm dependent on meeting them, <laughs> encountering them. For instance, I don't know, uh, the flower in a garden or something like that. And they always come as a surprise. I'm always puzzled. Mm because I cannot anticipate their possibility a priori precisely because they do not, they have their own form. They are not dependent on my forms. They are, they don't, they're always, they don't fit. 
we could say. Um, and because of that, however, beauty is not a thing that I can have determinate knowledge of. Mm. Be precisely because I cannot anticipate it in its generality and because I cannot anticipate the form of the beautiful, be it of a natural beauty or of artistic beauty a priori in the same way that I can with the objects of nature, for instance. Um, and but rather than being nothing for us, because that could also be the thing, like when we read the first critique or also the second critique, it appears nearly as if because of, you know, these, this categorical apparatus, it appears nearly as if, and, and because of these determinant conditions of what can come into view, it appears that what does not obey these forms is simply, well, yeah, it cannot come into view. We cannot recognize it as something. And that's clearly not the case with beautiful things or with living things. They can, they are part of nature. They are part of experience. We can encounter them. They appear to be contingent from the perspective of theoretical philosophy or of the contingent um, of uh, the understanding. They appear as accidents. But at the same time, I, you know, throughout my life, I will encounter them again and again, and I will call them beautiful. And so there must be something different that is going on that from the perspective of the first critique um, was considered, yeah, uh, not possible, we can say. And in order to account for that, he makes another split. <laughs> Uh, and that is he cuts in half judgment and he differentiates judgment into determining judgment um, which are which is productive of these secure knowledge claims um, according to the first critique that I've tried to lay open a little bit and then the other side of judgment is what he will call reflecting judgment which itself will have these two parts, aesthetic judgment and teleological judgment. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of distinctions. Um, so a difference is introduced into judgment after the first critique, after the second critique, meaning after the fact, judgment can now be either determining or reflecting. And we learn or Kant proposes that rather than subsuming a general under, partic under a particular, like in determining judgment, in reflecting judgment, we reflect on the form of an object. And this form, however, again, differently to determining judgment, is not provided by our transcendental um, I prior forms, which are, you know, for Kant, they are the transcendental conditions for the possibility of objects. That is not where these forms come from. And so we cannot, as I said, anticipate these forms. Instead, when we encounter them, we're always surprised, we're always triggered, we're always confused, we might be angered, or we might have, we, we are affected in a myriad of different ways. And yet a judgment, he argues, ensues nonetheless, even though we cannot classify and subsume them and Say what it is and then put it to the side. So a judgment ensues nonetheless, and that is a reflective judgment. 
and the investigation of that of this sort of like conglomerate of things so oh my god i had made this claim to totality that you know these forms whether or whether the laws of nature or of morality apply categorically but there are these weird things that i continue to encounter and they do not behave they do not obey um and they nevertheless allow me to do something with them and something very specific that is the thing and I'm going to call this reflecting judgment and the investigation of what this exactly is. So both what this form is and exactly what it does with me. That is the object of the third critique. And the third critique as a whole. And I will come to that. Next, as I said, is to somehow be some kind of bridge between these two worlds of nature and morality. So how, why, that is sort of like the, um, the next sort of like point that um, we need to address and that I'm, I'm gonna move on to now. So if nature, allows for the existence of such diverse self-organized forms that do not obey my categorical apparatus and the laws of nature and of physics, etc. If nature allows for the existence of these things, this ultimately means that there is such a thing as freedom in nature. This is sort of like the very, very, very important point that is made. And that means that the, I think one could polemically claim, you know, that the critique of the power of judgment Oh, yeah, sorry, just to repeat why I need to prove that there is freedom in nature. And that is because I can only think about freedom and I have the moral duty to act and bring about freedom, but I can have no knowledge whether these acts that I'm doing, I can never be, let's say, like scientifically sure that these acts that I'm doing when I'm sort of like acting according to the categorical imperative will actually or have actually brought about freedom. This also means that I cannot cognize myself as a free being, but I must nevertheless think of myself as a free being. There's like a, you know, because of this split between concepts and ideas, I can cognize the objects of nature, but I can only think ideas. But if I can encounter, and I, I would, I mean, it's maybe interesting, but Kant seems to suggest that they are not that common, these special kinds of objects, but they're also not extremely uncommon because we live in a world filled with living things. And all of us might have had at one point or another an experience of marveling at a natural, beautiful thing. <laughs> and of course, the other thing, um it's a little bit different but you know we will also have to speak about the sublime which is sort of a part of the critique of aesthetic judgment he says it's not it's a specific kind of object it's rare it's an exception but it's not that rare in the sense that he would assume i imagine because he does not offer ample phenomenological descriptions of these special kinds of objects, um, suggesting that he thinks we, we all know what that is. We've all had these kind of puzzling experiences. We've all felt the need of calling something beautiful um, and not understanding it uh, and just marveling at it. He says, because nature affords 
these kinds of things that do not obey the laws of nature, but have their own form, follow their own purpose, their own thing. I can now say that there is such a thing as freedom in nature. This means that the third critique, so the critique of the power of judgment, yes, talks about natural and artistic beauty, genius, the system of the fine arts, etc. But the reason why he inquires, for instance, into these art artistic expressions, we could say, is because his claim is that the fact that these things exist next to natural beauties, next to the living thing, they are nothing but the condition of possibility for freedom in nature. So the thing that these two worlds that appear to have been separated by an incalculable gulf that cannot be crossed, we must understand ourselves as both a phenomenal and a noumenal being, as both subject you know, to the natural laws, but nevertheless as autonomous and free. They somehow, we, we still cannot bring them together like that, but nevertheless, we seem to be able to say with a certain level of certainty that there are certain free things in nature. These special classes of objects. Because nature allows for the concrete existence of these purposive objects. So I cannot, I can never say that they're possible. I can only say they're actual. I can never anticipate their possibility, but I encounter them in their actuality and then say they are. So because nature allows for the existence of these three purposive objects upon which when we encounter them, the laws of our understanding are powerless. I, this seems to be the consequence of that, of course, in my dual existence as both a phenomenal and a noumenal being, as both subject to the laws of nature and subject to um, the laws of freedom, the law of freedom, can should be able, therefore, also to introduce change in the world. And that, we could say, I mean, this was very polemically put, but in a way, this is the, how to say, the, um, the aim, you know, of why he writes the third critique is to provide this bridge between the first critique and the second critique, between nature and freedom, between determinism and free will. And yes, you can say it is a very strange bridge <laughs> and it might be difficult because, you know, he creates, he puts up such strong boundaries of what is, what we, what we can actually say about them. But in the course of unraveling these um, special kinds of objects and their existence and our um, engagement with them, he will make a number of really uh, inventive philosophical things, <laughs> you know. Um, so the first of which is, of course, this notion of purposiveness. Um, so, yes, so we have already said, and I think we, the whole point is that they these special kinds of objects, they follow their own law. They're, they have their own form. They seem to be self-organized. They are organized according to a form and according to a law that it does not come from me in a certain sense. And this is called purposiveness. Zweckmäßigkeit. 
they organize themselves around a goal, around an end, or around a telos. And even though we cannot recognize purposiveness in a concept of the understanding, so I, I will talk about this another time about um, the threefold synthesis, the last step of which is then recognition in the concept. So even though we cannot recognize purposiveness in a concept the way we can do with the categories of the understanding, we still somehow recognize on another level these special forms, like I said, they are something for us rather than nothing. They're not merely noise. They can come into view as a part of nature because they affect us with an A, they affect us in a certain way. And this is one of the um, sort of like big inventions uh, that he does in a third critique. So what is this mode of affection? Um, upon encountering these things in the world, as part of nature, we feel something, and that which we feel is pleasure. In German, Lust. And the question then, of course, is why is purposiveness pleasurable? So, why is the purpose of form? of these special kinds of objects pleasurable for us. And so this is um, the question for my second point. And I just wanted to ask if you know you have any questions or contributions or comments at this point or you need a break or I don't know. So yeah I think you can just speak. We're so few people I think let's just go. Sure. Um, um, my question is, um, uh, let me, let me articulate like this, uh, that um, you, um, when we talk about, um, uh, the formal purposiveness of, uh, nature, um, we propose that, uh, if I understood, um, and correctly, if we suppose that to be able to say that there is a unity and the multiplicities that the nature um, um, uh, affords to. But that unity uh, is not some that we experience, we only presuppose it because the form, our understand, the form of our, let me say it like that, pr pr uh, prediction about the world uh, is through unity. We can only talk about one thing. This is somehow like a Socratic point of, uh, or Plat Platonic book. What we talk about, something, even when we he talks about the thing in itself or X object there in the first critique, he uh, repeats this point, if I, uh, I'm not mistaken, that when, because and predicates the thing in itself as the X of the, the of his X, um, as one thing, it's, we cannot um, um, we cannot access then it, we can talk we can think about it uh, so here I think the point would my point is repeated actually um, um, that uh, when we talk about um, this whole uh, purposiveness of for example the whole system of beauty uh, we only presuppose this whole system to be able to talk about it uh, would that be right or or not um, would you agree with that or um, there there are some nuances I think I mean, I hope there are some nuances. Otherwise, I think there would be no reason for the third critique as a whole. Um, but in one of the nuances that um, I would like to suggest, I mean, you're certainly you're entirely right. Well, unity has a very problematic role in Kant in the sense that there seems to be an ever receding need to charge something ever higher with providing unity. It always seems that it is solved and then we realize 
it's in fact dependent on something else. The best example of that um, is like you said, uh, in relation to the thing in itself or in synthesis where it seems that the first part of synthesis is apprehension and then comprehension. And finally, we come to recognition a concept which in the beginning of the critique of pure reason, we assume this is the source of unity. You know, um, concepts are functions of unity and we use them in judgment um, as the general rule under which we can subsume particulars. So it seems that concepts come last in the threefold synthesis, which is the act by which we transform something that is given to us as the matter of intuition into something that we can cognize and then subsume and, and say with, you know, that what it is. And mm -hmm. as we move through these different steps, we realize, okay, it, the first act is called apprehension. Of, but in fact, the concept already must lurk before apprehension. And what lurks always before um, recognition in a concept, so it's the role of the understanding, is reason. <laughs> and so there's always, there's always like something sort of like receding and the source of unity in Kant is like really difficult to pin down in a certain sense. And some people then come to the conclusion that in fact there's a pre-established harmony or, you know, there are, it's, um, um, depending on sort of like your reading and your other philosophical affiliations, you come to different conclusions. And what is interesting about the third critique, apart from these reflections on form, and you're completely right, or it's interesting to think about, you know, what form can even mean here? Because this form has nothing to do with the forms of intuition or the concept. Like, what is this form, you know? And what does it mean? Um, what is interesting is that it appears that there is a different access to the self that is possible in the third critique. We, the transcendental subject is not only in the end, you know, another source, pure logical source of unity, empty, a pure logical function as in the first critique, we could say. Here, there seems to be a different access to the self, the self no longer as a pure logical point, we could say, another source of unity. But, and I'm really sort of like jumping ahead and I don't know how much you can follow me there or maybe this doesn't make any sense to you yet at all, but I'm gonna try to come back to it. What we realize is that when we encounter these forms, like I said, they have, they seem to have their own form. The form doesn't come from us. And we will now move on to they affect me in a certain sense, which means here that I feel a sense of pleasure. And even though I will not speak about this today, only later, but what this pleasure is or what it does is it will give me a feeling of life. And this feeling of life is a very mysterious thing that he has here, but it seems to be something like an autopoetic feedback loop or something like that, we could say. And this is really very schematically put, but that seems to be a different access to the self and a different form and a different unity that was not 
there in the first critique. And that's, I think, one of the very interesting things about the third critique that, yes, um, things diversify and things change and things are put into motion. And we are no longer merely talking about the mind, we're talking about what he calls the Gemüt. And we are no longer even, polemically put, in a world of subjects and objects. Because the things I encounter, I cannot determinately judge them as an object, the same way I can judge most other things in nature. And what it does to me is also very different because I can feel myself alive no longer as a pure logical point of unity that is purely needed in order to unify experience. So yeah, sorry, this is my very long-winded <laughs> sort of response to your question on whether- um, no, Thank you, that was fantastic. And, yes, <laughs> but, but one more um, question. Um, um, there, there also he talks about um, the difference between uh, transcendental, um, transcendental judgment Judgment and physical judgment. If uh, um, the transcendental judgment, uh, the difference between the physical ju judgment and transcendental judgment, as you said, uh, is the, between the condition of possibility and something extra. And he doesn't talk about it that what something extra. Um, for if his example is causality. Uh, he said that if, if we say everything um, with a movement has a um, every movement has a cause. Uh, this is a transcendental judgment. If we say that every movement has a cause and that is an extra cause, this is a uh, metaphysical judgment. Um, would you be able to um, uh, talk about that a little more? And, and if we say that even any any second second properties in Aristotelian uh, sense, that would be in this sense would be a metaphysical judgment, right? Wouldn't be anything to do with this transcendental. Uh... Arman, I really appreciate this question. But how about you prepare a presentation on that for next class, and I go on. And I go on with what we have to talk because I think we will need some of the things that I still need to talk about today. Um, and um, and I think we, yeah, it would. Um, I think it it would take too long for me now to go into that, and I'm afraid to I miss on the opportunity to um get through what i think is necessary to get through today if that is all right yes absolutely absolutely sure thank you all right <laughs> so um i'm looking forward to your uh presentation and uh question for now i will try <laughs> and um schematize for us the link between pleasure and propulsiveness that is the question of why purposiveness is pleasurable and what that means and of course um like i said it will be schematic because he touches on all these things in the introduction so i'm still in the introduction and um, but then he will lay them open more systematically and more in detail later so we will in a way in a you know very usual philosophical manner, we will encounter all these things again in more detail later down the line. So I propose to read, if you open your books, um, I propose to read a short paragraph from page 75 of the Cambridge University Press edition, or you know, according to the Academy edition, which is this German edition, which is normally how we quote Kant. Um, from five, which is the issue of the third critique, and then page 189. Um, five, 189, or in the Cambridge edition, it's the page 75. And um, the paragraph, I will read it quickly, and then we will unpack it a little bit. Um, so our point is, we try to understand now 
why is propulsiveness pleasurable and what does pleasure mean and why does Kant all of a sudden need to introduce pleasure? Why, what does judgment have to do with pleasure? You know, and why does it, is it in need of a critique? So he writes, however, the subjective aspect in a representation which cannot become an element of cognition at all <coughs> is the pleasure or displeasure connected with it. For through this, I cognize nothing in the object of the representation, although it can well be the effect of some cognition or other. Now, the purposiveness of a thing, insofar as it is represented in perception, is also not a property of the object itself, for such a thing cannot be perceived, although it can be derived from a cognition of things. Thus, the purposiveness that precedes the cognition of an object which is immediately connected with it, even without wanting to use the representation of it for a cognition, is the subjective aspect of it that cannot become an element of cognition at all. The object is therefore called purposive, in this case only, because its representation is immediately connected with the feeling of pleasure. So this is the very important line. The object is therefore called purposive because its representation is immediately connected with the feeling of pleasure. And this representation itself is an aesthetic representation of the purposiveness. So in order to unpack this, we immediately begin and realize that, in fact, Kant now seems to say that purposiveness, Zweckmäßigkeit, is not a property of an object. In order to make sense of this, we need to understand something else, which is the difference between subjective and objective when it comes to representation. But in order to understand that, so the difference between the subjective and objective act of representation, we first need to know what a representation is. <laughs> so what is the representation for Kant? Um, you can write a PhD dissertation on this. But in the most basic sense, um, the German word that he uses is Vorstellung. So to place something in front of myself, which is translated as a representation in English, even though someone like Bergson pointed out that it should properly be called presentation because it is not a repetition of something. It is a mental act and for Kant, this is uh, it's also a mediating concept because this mental act includes the most diverse mental acts from sensation to ideas. So a sensation is a representation, a perception is a representation, a concept is a representation, and an idea is a representation. So from the most empirical to the most pure and abstract mental acts there are. These are all representations. They're all Vorstellungen for Kant. Um, and now he says, representations, Vorstellungen, have themselves a subjective and an objective aspect. The objective has to do something with determining judgment that we have already talked about before. 
because the objective act or aspect of representation is grounded somehow in the interaction between these two kinds of a priori forms that I've already mentioned, so forms of sensibility and understanding, um, which then in cognition, so when I relate to something in the world, when I aim to judge something in the world, determinately, objectively, cognize through the operations of the understanding or re reason what an object is. So these judgments have what he calls like objective validity, which is very difficult for him. He needs to prove it, blah, 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 but nevertheless. When it comes to the subjective aspect of representation, we have to be a little bit careful because for Kant, subjective never means without objectivity. There is something in our representation which is only subjective. And this very subjective aspect of representation we now learn is in what is interrogated in the critique of the power of judgment. We could say that the objective aspect of representation is interrogated maybe in the first critique and now we know, okay, and so the subjective aspect is interrogated in the third critique. And Kant in a sense will propose that this subjective aspect has its own kind of objectivity. And this kind of objectivity, we may say, is dependent on the power of the subject. Um, so, um, I've already said that um, Kant claims, this is sort of like the rhetorical force, of the critique of pure reason. That's also why it's not called a critique of pure reason or the critique of pure reason, because it is critique of pure reason, which ends the critical business forever and for all times and applies categorically, it means that Kant claims in the critique of pure reason that he has in fact enumerated successfully and for all of times, all of the universal and necessary principles of the objectivity of objects. So how objects can come into view, right? I've, I've tried to explain that before. He, there's a claim to totality. They apply categorically. And then we move on to the third critique. All of a sudden we hear that there are these unruly things that do not obey. So there are some things that successfully resist the supposedly universal and necessary conditions of how objects can come into view for us, legislated by the understanding and reason. And in the face of these unruly things, our cognitive faculties of the understanding and of reason, they are powerless. They pose a problem in the philosophical sense. They are a problem, they are problematic because we do not know how they are possible because questions of possibility and impossibility are questions of determining judgment. And so, Nevertheless, we can meet them, we can be surprised by them, we can call them beautiful. And, but we are surprised and we are puzzled because our cognitive faculties, we could say like normally, when we in, engage in the process of determining 
something that we encounter and we determine what it is or what we should do. So in, in moral judgments or in determining judgments, these cognitive faculties, upon encountering these disobedient kinds of objects, are, as it were, suspended. My cognitive faculties are suspended. And yet, I judge this strange, surprising object nonetheless. I say with conviction that it is beautiful. And so something must remain. There is a suspension of the cognitive faculties and something remains. And that which remains, which is the subjective aspect of representation is the feeling of pleasure and displeasure. So lust and unlust in German. The question then is why and how the special kind of object can produce this pleasure, can in a way suspend my cognitive faculties and deal only with the subjective aspect of representation and can affect me in this way that what remains is pleasure. So where does pleasure come from? Um, upon encountering as I said, and I think I cannot sort of like stress that enough because it's really important. I encounter one of those objects and I'm puzzled, right? Um, I'm puzzled because the object does not obey the laws or the forms of the understanding. And my a priori laws, my, these forms are powerless. And my cognitive faculties are suspended. And what does it mean to suspend the cognitive faculties then? They are, interestingly enough, suspended from their use. And what is a use? It means that, um, and in a way, this is much of the work of the first critique, is to lay open the relationship between the different faculties to one another. So, you know, in intuition is how the world comes to us. It provides the matter. And then the a priori forms of intuition are sort of like a first container in which it can appear, but the a priori forms are already pre-structured by the forms of unity of the understanding. And the power of imagination is sort of like the lever, but it gets the law from the understanding, which is itself dependent on reason. So there are these very complicated sort of like, one could even say like, it's like a quasi machine in which, you know, different faculties gain their law from another faculty. And so are sort of like dependent on one another and sort of like engaged in this process of judging. And when we, encounter one of those things, they are, the, all my faculties are suspended from their use, their normal use, their own ends, so what they should do, what some other faculty or law tells them to do, as well as their usual hierarchical relation to one another. And um, just to point out that this notion of suspension is like Aufhebung, this, you know, is like Schiller really articulated that very well. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, a colored reading that I'm proposing here, but I think it really makes sense. I think he really sort of understood something very important there. So I encounter these special kind of objects and my spec cognitive faculties are suspended. They do not have a purpose anymore. So in a strange sort of way, the purpose of form of these special kinds of objects suspends the purpose 
of my cognitive faculties. And they are no longer engaged in their normal relations of hierarchies, of giving the law to each other, of depending on each other, of working under one another. But in fact, he tells us, Kant tells us that they engage in a play. They play with each other, my cognitive faculties. They are suspended from the difficult task of determinately judging, and they are set free to engage in a free interplay. So there is a special kind of object which allows my faculties to play. And it is this feeling of playing of the faculties freely. There's no like bossy, bossy child and one obedient child in the mind. It's like a free kind of dance. Um, this play is pleasurable. Not any object can do that. Not any object throws me back to myself, as it were, suspends my faculties and frees them from their purpose and sets them free to play. So this pleasure, this feeling of lust and unlust, in a way, expresses a certain kind of suitability of these special kinds of objects to my cognitive faculties. On a certain way, they are, are disobedient, so they do not behave, and they do not fit, and they do not um, suit the way that the objects of the natural sciences, of the physical world, seem to conform and fit into, but you know, we can discuss whether they really do, into these universal forms, and obviously, you know, we are all um, readers of lots of philosophy of the 20th century, which is a philosophy of difference, which focuses on everything that does not fit into these universal containers. So we can talk about that. But there's a different suitability when it comes to these special kinds of objects. It is not the suitability of determination, of this kind of like feeling of fitting, of something like clicking into the universal forms, which allows me to subsume particulars under universals. Because this suitability is the, uh, the law of obedience, like I said before, of phenomena, of matter, the matter of cognition to the forms that I have. Here we're talking about a different kind of suitability, a free suitability, a certain kind of harmony. Um, the beautiful denotes a special kind of object which suspends and frees my cognitive faculties from their purpose and um, allows me to reflect, because this is the word he uses, onto myself whereby my cognitive faculties engage in a self-organized, because now that there's no, no faculty stronger than the other, they somehow, they seem to somehow fit together in a free, harmonious, horizontal way, we could say. They engage in this kind of free relationship with one another, with one another not unlike what we could say we imagine might be the form of organization of these special kinds of things we see. We cannot be sure it's the same, but there seems to be some kind of analogy anyways in how Kant describes it. These things have their own form. No one gives them their form. No one whips them into order. And also all of a sudden my cognitive faculties, there are no more hierarchies and they sort of like engage in this harmonious. In German, we have this word reiben, like circular dance or like a play. Um, but of course, the problem that Kant needs to confront and which in a way is at the center of the third critique is the following. Pleasure, lust, has hitherto never been accepted as a transcendental element. 
in this point is indeed crucial because how can pleasure be the subject of a critique? Which according to Kant, a critique always needs to delineate and secure the transcendental conditions of possibility of something. So of nature or of objects in the first critique or of freedom or you know, of a moral act in the second critique. Normally pleasure depends on a subject. It, it is worldly, it is empirical, relative, pathological, you know, you name it, but it is not pure and it is not transcendental. So how can this pleasure, which seems to, we can now already see, seems to be the ground of reflective judgment, be the subject of a critique, because critique, a critique is always transcendental. It asks about conditions of possibility. Kant tells us the pleasure does not come from the object. If the pleasure came from the object, it would produce a determining judgment in us. The pleasure is only in the subject. Our cognitive faculties are suspended and are in play. And this feeling of suspension and play carries with it a feeling of pleasure. And if there was nothing a priori in this pleasure that I would feel upon encountering and having this kind of specific experience, then it could not become an object of a critique. And so this is in a way the outrageous and like inventive claim contribution of the third critique that there must be something non-empirical, some kind of transcendental aspect to pleasure. There must be a transcendental aspect to pleasure, to lust. And the occasion through which we can um, feel this Transcendental pleasure is uh, rare, but not that rare. There's a special kind of object, like I've already said, natural and artistic beauties and the living thing. Well, well, actually the living thing will not give us pleasure, but we discover the pleasure in natural and artistic beauty. Um, and this pleasure is must somehow be transcendental, it must be a priori, it must be pure. And yet, it is neither a cognitive principle of the understanding, nor a practical principle for our will. Pleasure appears to be a principle for the power of judgment. And thus, provides an object, possible object, a necessary object for a third critique. And this is what sets the third critique apart from the first two critiques. The first critique is obviously called critique of, the, of pure reason. So it's a critique of reason, of pure reason, of theoretical reason. The second critique is a critique of practical reason. And the third critique is a critique of the power of judgment. So they are not even, these are not three critiques of reason. The third critique has a different principle, is supposedly also a transcendental principle. That principle is pleasure, but it is a pleasure for the power of judgment. Um, okay. It is very late. This is always the problem in my seminars. Um, we have, I'm very sorry for that. I'm bad at organizing time. I always uh, prepare way too much. I, I propose to do the following. I propose to continue a little bit down this road on pleasure and move on to Derrida and um, move my third and fourth points so structure of the analytic of the beautiful and discussion of paragraphs one to nine to the next seminar and hopefully then we will have like five minutes to 
a little bit talk about pleasure, but we have touched upon these, you know, in a way, four claims of these moments of the analytic of the beautiful anyways already in, in the discussion. It would just have been sort of like trace it out a little bit more. And we will do that next time. And I, I will try to be more schematic than today. So um, as I said, Derrida um, thought about this um, Kantian invention of transcendental pleasure in a book called The Truth in Painting um, from 1978. And there he proposes to read the third critique as most of all a work on pleasure. And this pleasure for someone like Derrida, you know, a child of the 20th century and etc., cetera, for, for him is this pleasure that Kant is talking about is very strict and has in a way he say he says he proposes has to do without enjoyment and i am going to read a, a short passage from the truth in painting from page 45 of the english translation in case you want to look it up and um, so he writes now you have to know what you're talking about what intrinsically concerns the value beauty and what remains external to your imminent sense of beauty. Intrinsic and extrinsic. This permanent requirement to distinguish between the internal or proper sense and the circumstance of the object being talked about organizes all philosophical discourses on art, the meaning of art and meaning as such, from Plato to Hegel, Husserl and Heidegger. This requirement presupposes a discourse on the limit between the inside and the outside of the art object. Here, a discourse on the frame. I'm just quickly going to put it in the um, chat in case you want to look it up. So what is Derrida telling us here? There is, he says, a permanent requirement to distinguish between the imminent and the intrinsic when it comes to the art object. So there's, he says, or he seems to suggest, there's an internal, a proper sense of pleasure. And then there is what Der Derrida in his discourse, you know, in his idiom calls a metaphorical pleasure, which only gains, gains its meaning in relation to this intrinsic pleasure is dependent on the intrinsic pure pleasure. The problem of delineating pleasure, of a discourse on pleasure, thus seemingly, he says, in the history of art, always opposes proper to the metaphorical, the intrinsic to the extrinsic, and in Kant's case, a proper pleasure to a metaphorical ple ple pleasure. And pleasure, for Kant, and I, I'm sorry, I haven't talked about that yet, but he will, one of the moments of the analytic is to say that pleasure is disinterested. So I'm not interested in the existence of the object. So I do not need to, don't want to eat it. I don't want to do anything with it. I will talk about that um, next time. Um, so the proper pleasure is disinterested, pure, and the metaphorical pleasure, the one that is dependent on the proper pleasure, would be interested pleasure, so physical pleasures and uh, destruction and, and this kind of stuff. So Derrida, in a way, proposes that Kant founds his third critique on the difference, on, on the distinction between proper and metaphorical pleasure, the intrinsic and the extrinsic. Mm, and And so the, the move that Kant is supposedly doing, this is Derrida's reading, and I think it's very um, 
ingenious, and that's why I'm proposing is that, uh, I'm, and I'm introducing it to you, is that Derrida says, what Kant did was to, in a way, change what counts to be as the intrinsic pleasure and what counts to be as metaphorical pleasure. Prior to Kant, he seems to be saying, pleasure was always worldly and pathological, and then we could engage in certain ideas about reading and philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. But what Kant did in the third critique was to say, no, the proper pleasure, the intrinsic pleasure is this transcendental pleasure. And all other pleasures are in fact derivative of this intrinsic pleasure. This is the kind of move that Kant made in the third critique. Um, and all these other pleasures, including the agreeable, which Kant will talk about, and the morally good, and like all these other things, the worldly pleasures, they only make sense from now on in their meaning in relation to this transcendental pleasure, this proper pleasure. And so how has he managed to do that? So the reference for all other pleasures for Kant from the third critique onwards is this aesthetic transcendental ple pleasure. And it's premised on the existence of beautiful things. Um, what does it mean for something to de be dependent on something else in this kind of like Derridian way? What does it mean that there is an intrinsic and a metaphorical meaning? So when I say the legs of the table, this only makes sense in reference to my own leg or in reference to legs. <laughs> and, and it becomes clear that legs of the table are a metaphorical use of leg, which gains its meaning in relation to, well, in most cases, one's own leg. And, and so, this is in a weird sense, like what Kant does is he says that, yes, we have to, we have misunderstood everything until so until now about pleasure. We have thought that pleasure and satisfaction, and we could also say like drives and all of these things are, have nothing transcendental or pure intrinsic about them. And he, makes them into objects of transcendental status. You can say he makes them into transcendental problems and proposes that they are to be subjected to a transcendental critique. Mm. And Derrida says, this is Kant's achievement. Pleasure from Kant onwards is disinterested and pure and all other senses of pleasure are metaphorical. Mm, and so the, the, he has inverted the meaning between the proper and the metaphorical. Um, mm, I'm just trying to go through. Um, mm, and it is because of this inversion of pleasure proper that aesthetics in the way that Kant proposed it, which is also a rather young discipline that starts with Baumgarten, for those of you who are like familiar with um, aesthetic philosophy, was properly speaking, not an object of philosophical inquiry. Pleasure used to belong to the irrational, not the rational, to the empirical and essential part of our existence and could maybe be addressed in an anthropology or something like that. It was not a philosophical object proper um, because the particular, the irrational, the empirical were not treated philosophically because they belong to the theory of the senses. Um, and so for Kant to propose that the beautiful can become a philosophical object, he had to somehow, this is what Derrida proposes, invert the proper and the metaphorical meaning of pleasure and thereby transform We could say 
feelings or something like that into principles or give like a universality to them, propose them as the proper, invert the meaning. Um, and Derrida's point, in fact, goes further because he seems to suggest that all great is discourses on art do that. So Derrida argues that what a discourse on art necessarily needs to do is to invent a proper meaning of the beautiful and of pleasure. Because in order to give the beautiful the status of a philosophical object proper, which you know was Kant's intention, he only can claim that freedom in nature is possible if he can also prove that the beautiful, which is one of those examples of freedom in nature, is a proper philosophical object. And in order to prove that it's a proper philosophical object, Derrida says he had to invert the meaning of the proper and the metaphorical and in a way like raise pleasure, which until now was a problem of the empirical senses and maybe to be dealt with in an anthropology into a transcendental problem that was to be treated in its own critique one could say this is a critique of pleasure the third critique it might not be the pleasure that we like <laughs> we would like it to be because like Derrida says it's extremely strict um and um has no enjoyment um but he managed to invert it like that. Um, yes, I'm sorry. I we have arrived at the end of our time, but maybe we can go like five minutes over. And I don't know if there's anything you would like to sort of like um, contribute or any thoughts that you have, or if you have questions, maybe you can write them to me, um, and then I can address them in the beginning of the next class. If I may ask it too, just very quickly. Uh, initially, I was thinking about like this perfectness in connection to regulative ideas. I'm not sure how much it is correct right now, uh, but I just want to have a discussion with you on that. So, um, in the, okay, in the first critique, we have the potential of understanding and we have the potential of reason. Actually, you know, the potential of reason kind of organizes the concept of understanding and there is a kind of a, like a focal point like organizing them and give that focal point between this persistence. Like you don't, because we, these are my conditions, you never organize them, so they are not the really empirical objects. So I get the impression that actually we actually talk about the same purpose this kind of here. Um, but when you say something like, um, let's say like subtension, kind of things like that, I get a little bit like maybe are we in a different um like when i say is... what sorry i didn't understand when i say what i have you get uh, the feeling we're uh, different? yeah suspension suspension of ah. the faculties uh so is it like the suspension of let's say we have three ideas three regulative ideas when you mm. say this suspension of faculties is it like you know we kind of confuse our ideas and we have to kind of reorganize them or uh, maybe you can tell me more about that at your earliest convenience. I mean, in a way, you've gotten right down to the point. And again, to answer this question, I have to sort of like look a lot in advance, but it doesn't matter. I will just briefly do it. You're completely right. The, um, we could say that... Um, You know, another word for purposiveness is the system. And, um, and we have that in the first critique. And the system is organized according to these ideas. We, that's the function of ideas to help us systematize our knowledge, right? Into a whole. And science is dependent on this halt on the, the systematicity. And so even though we could say that the critique of pure reason argues or puts forth such, argues with such 
force and such conviction that um, we must keep apart understanding and reason because reason fabulates, you know, <laughs> and we can only have determinate knowledge claims when it comes down to the laws of the understanding and determining judgment, blah, blah, blah. We then learn once we move on from um, the transcendental analytic and we move into the second book, which some of you might know is called the transcendental dialectic, where we start dealing with reason and the ideas and what is called the special metaphysics. We realize that what he said must absolutely have, you know, we, we must clip the wings. There must be nothing. We realize that it is, and this is also, I think, what Armin referred to before, that reason and its systems must always already pre have pre-organized. There is, in a way, a very complex relationship between determinate cognition and the systematicity, which is the role and the function of relative judgments and um, these ideas. And there is some core form of suspension, one could say. I've never thought about it in that way, I have to admit. Um, because what does it mean to say as if? But today, <laughs> uh, also because I do not have, um, like I said, I, I did not really think about that in quite that way before, but my intuition is, or I would like to propose, but we can talk about that more next time, that this is a very different kind of suspension. We will encounter this as if, um, you know, next seminar, many, many, many times more, there will also be um, restrictions, very strong restrictions about what we can say about the beautiful and about the living thing. But the, the path that he proposes in the critique of the power of judgment in the third critique is very different because, and this is one of the problems of reading the two books not in relation to each other, because in, a, in many respects, these more systematic concerns, they will appear in the second part of the third critique. But, in order for the second part of the third critique to make any sense, they are dependent on something very important, which the first part reveals to us. There is something that we need aesthetic judgment for when it comes to teleological judgment, which will have a more direct relationship to the question of the system and regulative judgment. And that is that um, you will see that he will propose that this purposive form and this feeling of play and this strange suitability that these special kinds of objects have for me, it will fill me with a feeling and a sense that seems to have a very strong existential meaning for the subject, and I would say for the person called Kant, and namely that I am in the right place. This is a very strange thing because someone like Hans Blumenberg, like, you know, he, he said, it's very strange, like teleology was nearly dead. Um, with the Enlightenment, and then out of nowhere, Kant decides to resurrect it with this feeling of, you know, this, all this talk about teleological judgment, purposiveness, and having this idea that somehow the world and must have been arranged for me in relation to me. There's some kind of harmony. I am indeed in the right place, uh -huh. equipped so I... with the right. Sorry, I'm just going to quickly finish. And so even though I have this experience only in, with, in relation to particular objects, I will be able to extend this. And this is what he will call a technics of nature. 
And yeah, sorry. Yes, um, Gabriel. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's all about being at home. Yeah, so, but at the same time, uh, Kant should not uh, so misuse these regulative ideas to uh, complete the picture and give us this unity and whole problem I think is there. At first he prohibits it, but then flows, I, I don't know, I, I should read it right now. I, I think it's something in the third critic. Yeah, so I have this intuition, uh, but yeah. So yeah, I wanted to comment this. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, I mean, this is like the Hegelian um, um, uh, ridiculization um, that um, Kant puts up all these, you know, th various things, cur closes curtains, etc. And erects boundaries and cuts things in half, only uh, to then be troubled until yes, the rest of his life and trouble the entire history of philosophy ever since with the question of you know how to bring them back together. Maybe this is a good way to conclude for today. Um, if you have more questions, uh, please write them to me and um, or maybe, you know, you can do something like, I don't know, Victor, if this is possible, like send them to all of us. Um, and so other people can think about them, too, because you might have some, you know, aspect that or some point of view that I don't have, um, most likely. And I will try and um, address them next time. Um, and yeah, I'm very sorry that um, I never made it out of the introduction, but I do think we have gotten quite a good um, um, take on the introduction now. And I think you covered pretty well. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't look good. Ah, Vitor, they should send it to you and then you send it to everyone. Uh, no. Why well, just it to like you? Yeah, I don't think you have to do that. That might be too much work, but it's just, I think everyone might have, or Victor, what you could do is you could send an email to all of us. And so then we can press reply all. That's fine. I can do that. All right, cool. Um, all right. Um, and I will also talk with Victor quickly about sending around a sheet where you can say in what seminar you want to do a presentation. And maybe actually, if you have a question, you can present that question as your presentation if you are to do a presentation. Because like I said, I would like to have the presentations not as a chore, but if there's something you know you don't understand, then that might be um, the, in fact, best starting point um, to uh, go on a little excursion and um, let us come along with you. And we have only three seminars. So if there's like one or two presentations in each seminar, I think that's cool. And like I said, try to be like as precise as possible. We don't need introductions. Like, you know, we will all have read it. Like focus on the line that you think makes no sense or focus on the line that you think captures everything in the best way. Or or focus on the line that you think um, Heidegger response to was interpolated by, or introduce the line that you think Rancière misunderstood, <laughs> something like that. Um, all right. Thank you so much for uh, reading the third critique with me and um, allowing me to revisit it. And in... thank you. Thank you. Thanks. This was great. Have, Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.